Um, look. Go ahead. You know. <laughs> we want to hear you. Right. Hear you. Ten minutes past five, so it's a good, um, good moment to start. Welcome all. Um, I sort of ended up here fairly last minute and did by accident. I was supposed to be just uh, having a week on Iceland with my partner, who is doing an actual national tour. And Sean, who's been on uh, television and will be again tonight, I think. Uh, but then we were being dragged from a uh, camera studio to interview, and I thought, well, I might as well also do something if I can't, you know, go to Akureyri and see the sites. Um, so I thought I'd uh, spend a little bit of time of doing um, doing a little talk about uh, some of the issues that I work on, which is uh, IT strategy and policy, um, not just in the technical sense, but with the societal view and uh, paying attention to some of the issues that have been uh, doing the rounds here uh, in Iceland. Um, privacy and online freedom. Um, so in my view, it's something mostly nowadays that you need to get for yourself instead of waiting for somebody else to give it to you. But there is stuff that you, your government can do for you, so they can be helpful or they can be obstructive. And of course, and if you're a democracy, you can, can make sometimes your government do things for you. So. Um, just to give a little intro, this is the first computer I ever saw. Well, this type of computer, this is not the actual room I was in. Um, uh, at my father's work in 1977. Um, nowadays, a modern mobile phone is about 10,000 times faster and um, a lot smaller and also a lot cheaper. Uh, and this is what mobile phones used to look like. I don't know if some people may remember that one. Um, this is a bit more closer to home. 2000 and 2010, Apple. Uh, product thingy uh, with comparable sort of computing specs so you can sort of see the trend. Uh, this is the bigger trend. People think that this is a recent, you know, the fact that computers are getting more and more powerful. People think this is something recent that is only happening during their lifetime. This is not the case. It's been going on for over a century. It has nothing to do with microchips or Intel or Moore's Law or any of that. Moore's Law maybe, but it was going on long before Mr. Moore was even born. Um, computers have been getting almost twice as fast about every 18 to 14 months for over 100 years. Uh, first with uh, mechanical calculators, then electromechanical, then purely electronic, the Colossus in the Second World War to do a decrypting uh, very fast. And then we got into transistor computers, and then we got into microchip integrated circuits, and now we're in the microchip era and have been for some time, and we're going to continue to be in that era for another at least 15 years or so. The smallest path inside computers now where the, elect uh, the, the electricity goes through the chip, the little wire basically in the chip, is now about 17 atoms thick on the newest chips. So we can have that a few more times, but the physical end is inside and then we'll need to uh, figure out a new way of doing information processing if we want to keep up. Um, there are various ideas about this and so barring a sort of a global disaster that ends civilization probably computers will continue to um, double in price performance uh, computing power for the next generation, by which time a uh, commodity computer that we will have will be as powerful as a human brain, order of magnitude. So we see that um, stuff that was computationally impossible even a decade ago is now becoming possible at a price level that is actually useful. So Japan is a decade ahead of uh, most of the Western robotics, but we now see that we have the computing power to make robots actually do somewhat smart stuff at a cost level that is actually affordable. Um, we also see all kinds of other areas where <coughs> low-cost computing power is relevant, such as 3D printers. This is a, a, a key of the Dutch uh, handcuffs for the Dutch police, which is printed in plastic after somebody took a couple of pictures of a Dutch police officer. This was back in 2009. These printers can now be bought for something like a thousand euros, and they're getting better and better and better. So computers were often viewed as just basically better typewriters, um, which was possibly true for a long time, but it is no longer true. Um, they are a much more fundamental sort of societal force, and that's what we need to think about. Um, the best way to compare them, the best way to compare them may well be the printing press, which completely changed society. It brought about the modern world. Uh, prior to this machine, uh, replicating a single book was a year's work of a highly educated person, namely somebody that could read and write. Um, with this machine, you could have people who could not read and write, but they could still reproduce books. 
And so the whole process could sort of self-start itself into a much higher level of information and knowledge being available in society. And within 50 years after this machine had been invented, the Middle Ages had ended and we were into the Renaissance. And that's probably not a coincidence. We also entered the period of 250 years of civil war in Europe because now everybody had a Bible in his own language and then people started to read and then people started to think about it and then we had some major religious wars about different interpretations. Uh, but in the end, the modern world came out of that. Industrialization, democracy, all kinds of things where you need information going around in society very quickly, very cheaply to allow it. So we've been doing that now for about half a millennium and we're, you know, we're sort of fairly used to some of those ideas. And since the late 60s, we've been hooking up computers globally, now several billion. So now everybody has its own printing press. And each of you can just type something in some sort of web form tonight, and then it'll be globally available to anybody who can read the language that you're typing in. And so now we all have our own printing press. Uh, it's the next step up. And we don't exactly know what the social consequences of this technology will be. We're still busy discussing it and absorbing it and thinking about it. Um, but it will probably at least be at least as fundamental as the printing press. And you know, that only completely changed pretty much every aspect of society um, than before. So this is going to be pretty intense. So computers are not just a technical tool. They are a political force in society. And we should think about them as such. So printing presses are not just technical tools. They are social forces. And they are regulated. We don't want a single company owning all the printing presses. Because then, you know, you get a single point of view, and that's bad for all kinds of things. Um, so we have to think about computers the same way. They are, um, uh, they need to be viewed as political tools, and therefore there might need some regulation or at least some social thought about them. So, um, according to some people in the current um, Icelandic government, there's a big problem with pornography. All the naughty <laughs> pictures you can find online. And particularly when those body pictures, uh, uh, when they are uh, viewed by young children, that has terrible consequences. Now, I don't have children, so I really can't speak very much to that. I've also not seen any statistics on how big this problem is and, and you know, what the basis is for that. So there may very well be a problem with nine-year-olds finding you know, quite horrible stuff on the internet and viewing it, and um, this might have all kinds of consequences. Um, but probably attempting to block streams of bits over the internet, which was designed to move around streams of bits, is not going to work. Various countries, like China, have spent considerable amounts of money on it, probably more than the gross national product of this country, and they have completely failed. Because many of their citizens are able to circumvent the great firewall of China and access Google News um, from abroad. Uh, so we just had a, a little case in um, the Netherlands, this is Dutch, for which I apologize. We just had a case uh, the day before yesterday in the Netherlands where a, a Dutch uh, university professor, uh, of, um, not a media professor, but a food chemistry guy, um, was a bit bored halfway down his lecture and he decided to spend his lecture break of 20 minutes watching porn on his laptop while being in a room like this in front of an audience like this. None of which would have been a really big problem, except he forgot to turn off the beamer. <laughs> so you can sort of imagine. Um, now, um, I took this screenshot this way and not the rest of this image, because I don't want to be the next professor who gets booted out of the university for showing porn on a screen like this. Um, but I'm assured it was quite spectacular. <laughs> so it might be that that kind of material and those kinds of images are a problem. But if you think that you know naked people or even sexually explicit images on the internet are the biggest problem of information on the internet, you need to get out more, basically. <laughs> um, there is much nastier information you can find on the internet than pictures of naked people. And this is just one of the examples. Even 20 years ago, you could get imprisoned in the US for merely drawing the shape of the W88 a multi-stage thermonuclear warhead because its design was very, very secret. Now it's out, you can just grab this off with uh, This is another piece of data you can download. I'm not sure if people recognize this. They may. Uh, this is actually a 3D CAD drawing uh, designed to be printed on 3D printers in either plastic or stainless steel, and it's that part. It's the regulated part of the AR-15 rifle. 
All the other parks, certainly in America and in many other countries in the world, are non-regulated, which means they can be freely bought, often at places like Walmart. It's that part um, that you can download as a design from the internet, then 3D print either in hard nylon or in stainless steel if you have the correct 3D printer, and then you can just put it together and you have a working rifle. And actually, rifles have been made this way and have been fired, and they actually work. So again, you can now download at least parts of firearms from the internet. Now, anybody who has, in the last decade, uh, been on a plane, and who has also been on a plane before 9-11, will have noticed a significant difference in the way human beings are now treated before they enter planes. Um, it is getting sort of progressively more surreal, and this is one of the reasons why I generally prefer high-speed trains in continental Europe to flying, but in this case, of course, uh, this is really the only way to get here, practically. Um, so there's some weird stuff uh, going on in the world. And so we have a weird situation where uh, parents will say, well, I don't want my children to watch um, horrible pictures on the internet of violence. Yet, of course, these same parents are supporting their government that does this very violence to actual children. So, again, I don't have children, but I don't see how, as a parent, you can support this kind of violence against children politically and then say, I don't want my children to see these pictures. Uh, there's something very, very wrong there. Now, the other weird thing is, of course, that um, we used to have a media system that had the goal of informing us as citizens so that we could make better democratic political decisions. Now, some of these media systems have eminently failed in this at the most horrible level. We can't even imagine. For those who are geographically challenged, Fox News says Egypt is there. I'm pretty sure that's not right. <laughs> I'm also pretty sure that Fox News knows this. I don't know, maybe they're, they're even more stupid than we think, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not that bad. So, I prefer to get my news not from broadcast media anymore, because exceptions, you know, there are a few exceptions, but in general it's just either uninformed crap or outright lies, such in this case. And of course there's all kinds of other interesting stuff that you generally don't see in the newspapers that you can find online if you know where to look, which means typing in a few search terms in a, a search engine. So this is a part of an interesting memo that was written nine months before we bombed the crap out of Iraq. And it basically says that both the US and the UK government knew precisely that there were no weapons of mass destruction. But that didn't matter, because the policy decision to go to war with Iraq had already been taken, completely irrespective of whether there were weapons of mass destruction. And now we have the original document, documentary proof, that we were lied into this thing. It's no longer a mistake, you know, a faulty intelligence. It's a lie. It's a real war crime. And now we know. We have the proof. We can no longer deny it. We can never say, ich habe es nicht gewusst, to use a famous German uh, <laughs> pronoun. So, the internet, of course, has been going longer than I've been alive, um, but it's only really been in the last, I don't know, decade, or even maybe in the last six years, that its adoption has gone into all the way of society. Because now it's so user-friendly that anybody can use it very easily. Many people, you know, don't build a website, they just have a Facebook page. And of course, Facebook is very convenient. There was a Facebook event for this event. This is my first Facebook event. I have been a very reluctant Facebook user. I've had an account since, I don't know, a very long time ago. But I've only activated it recently since this was a precondition of being able to teach in certain Dutch educational institutions. Which again, if you think about it, is rather weird that these are publicly funded institutions. But if you want to be a teacher there or be a student in those institutions, you have to have a Facebook account. Which means having a contractual relationship with a foreign private company with a rather, rather dubious track record when it comes to your privacy. So it's a sort of a mix of the public and the private that is questionable to say the very, very least. Now, it is very, very understandable at the operational level that, you know, in a small um, uh, a university group that doesn't have any money and it doesn't want to buy a system and run a system, oh, we'll just do it on Facebook. Everybody's already on Facebook anyway. So there are lots of practical reasons to say, oh, we'll just do it this way and, you know, what the hell, privacy, I mean, don't, you know, don't be such a, a naff old school person. Um, 
The problem with Facebook is, I don't deny the utility of Facebook. It's a very convenient tool. What I think is it has a couple of properties that have nothing to do with its utility or even a lack of utility, for which we might want to seriously reconsider what we want to use it for or whether we want to use it at all. So it's a little bit like this stuff, which is called asbestos, which is, is a fantastic building material. It's very cheap, it's fire retardant, it's insulating material, it's very strong, it's, it's stable under all kinds of weird conditions. So it's a really great building material and for this reason we used it for many, many years throughout the Western world to build all kinds of stuff. And then we figured out that it had another property, which has nothing to do with its utility as a building material, but it is relevant. Namely, it gives people cancer. And so we've stopped using it. Not because it's no longer useful as a building material, but because this other property, which has nothing to do with buildings, is so important that we say, okay, let's not do this. Maybe we don't wanna, we don't wanna go there. Despite the fact that it's fire retardant and cheap and strong and you know, all those good things. So there's this one bad thing about it, and therefore we're not going to use it, despite its utility. I think Facebook is a little bit like asbestos. There are a lot of practical advantages, but there are a few major societal problems in that we had an internet which was a peer-to-peer -peer network, where everybody could have a server and then all the servers talk to each other, but nobody was centrally in control. That was its big feature. Now we're getting a situation where a handful of large companies actually run a sort of centralized infrastructure and we are all just their users. We're not even their clients because we're not paying them. In fact, in most cases, we're, you know, we're not their clients, we're their products. Anybody who thinks that they're the client of Facebook, unless you have a marketing company that pays them large bags of money, you're not Facebook's client. You're Facebook's product. Your data is Facebook's product. Every time you do something. So, Social media, certainly in Europe, is now one of the hot terms. There are even social media experts. I don't know how you can be an expert in a technology that's only been around for like 36 months, but those people exist. I think we're still struggling with email sometimes, which is, again, about 40 years old now. But I think most of us have sort of gotten the hang of email. You know, there is a difference between reply and reply to all. And if you want to keep your job, you need to be aware of those differences. <laughs> so it took, took us a little bit of time to figure it out, but we figured it out. With all this new stuff, most organizations and many people literally don't have a clue yet what this is good for, what it's not good for, and when you should really you know, stay far away from it. Um, also, the technology is moving so fast that again, you know, every 18 months it's a new thingy. Um, so, I use Twitter myself and I'm on Facebook and the other two are already dead, I think, because this picture again is 18 months old. I think we want to be very wary of, you know, moving important social functions into these systems that we know nothing of. And trusting private companies with basically, you know, all our movements and information. So, I would advise people to just um, read stuff. And this is not fun to read, you know, the terms and conditions of Google, and instead of Google you can put up any other company, be it an online company or a software company. You know, when you use software products, you click OK, but do you know what you're saying OK to? Because if you actually read it, and I can't even read this because it is English legalese, and I don't read legalese, probably like most of you. Um, but I have some friends who are lawyers, and they've read it, and this is quite weird. The stuff is in here. It states things about that they can do to your data that is really quite harrowing. In case of software, it states things that they can do to your computer once their software is on your computer that you really don't want to have done to your computer if you value your privacy. Um, so at least if you're part of an organization and you're using this stuff, somebody within that organization should have a look at this and see if it's even remotely compatible with you know, what you're about. Now, because we are now banking online and um, doing all kinds of things that involves money, we've gotten cybercrime. People are using um, things that can go wrong with the internet to steal money from us or do other things that may be illegal. And the thinking in many governments has been, we need to fight that the same way we fight physical crime in the world. Namely, we need people with big cars, possibly armored, and we need to give them guns and, and those kinds of things, and then they need to go after these bad guys and then catch them. Um, 
The problem with that, of course, is that nation states are geographically limited and the internet is not. And so fighting cybercrime with the same mentality as you know, the police car chasing another car down the road after the bank robbery, it's a nice thought, but it just doesn't work that way. What you can do, of course, is preventative. You can make sure that systems aren't leaking. You can also educate your citizens to a situation where if they get this funny mail from PayPal that says there's a problem with your PayPal account, click on this link. It's a, an address in the Ukraine. Fill in you know, your PIN number, your password, your PayPal account, your credit card number, and then press OK and we'll take care of you. And then suddenly money starts disappearing. The funny thing is that while many Western governments now spend a lot of money and time and resources on fighting cybercrime or cyber war, the single thing that they pretty much all fail at is basic education of their citizens so the citizens can protect themselves from basically guys from all kinds of places around the world who want to steal your money. So what they do completely fails and what they don't do then also fails but that's the only thing that really can protect given the state of technology can protect people is proper education. Now to make things even worse they say there's not only cyber crime, we now also have cyber war. Um, and many countries are gearing up for that as well. Because, uh, well, you know, it's a new thing to do and armies need a job. Um, this country doesn't have one. Hats off to you. Uh, but most other countries do and these guys are always seeking a new enemy to, to do something to. Um, so, uh, most countries are now gearing up for this. Um, and then are of course blaming other countries that are doing something or are accused of doing something as an excuse for doing the gearing up. Um, the weird thing of course that the one case that we actually know of that could be counted as an act of war against a country by another country was done by Western countries to a country in the Middle East, namely Iran. A nuclear installation in Iran that was a civilian installation, it was not a threat to the West, was attacked and significantly damaged in what by any reasonable definition, is an act of war. It was the Stuxnet virus launched against the Natanz installation in Iran. Now, it's very easy to figure out that this should be considered an act of war merely by asking yourself the question, if Iran had done the same thing to a nuclear power plant in France, how would NATO have responded? You can sort of figure it out from there, basically. So the problem, of course, with cyber weapons is that once you use them, they're out there. So Stuxnet is now floating around the planet, is being adapted to all kinds of other interesting applications. Um, by people, we have no idea who they are, where they are, what their motivations might be um, to do something. But the West has basically signaled to everybody on the planet, it doesn't matter that you're not breaking international law. It doesn't matter that you're no threat to us. It doesn't matter that you're not attacking anybody. We are going to cyber attack your industrial infrastructure anyway, simply because we can and we feel, no, it's convenient to do it this week. So now, of course, all the other countries are saying, okay, well, apparently this is where we are. We need cyber war capability. So now Russia and China and everybody in Asia and South America, everybody is, is building this stuff. And it's easy, it's cheap, and it's pretty much undetectable. It's much easier to build cyber weapons somewhere in the corner of a university quietly, without telling many people, than building aircraft carriers and rockets and you know, all that sort of stuff. At the same time that governments are creating cyber offensive weapons, and you have no idea what they're good for and if they're even good for anything, if you look at how they internally take care of data, usually our data by the way, which we hire them to take care of us for us, they're crap. I think. Um, even in a tiny country like Iceland, there are pretty, probably some spectacular examples of, of government not doing that well in taking care of your data somewhere. Um, I know many examples in Europe where governments have spectacularly failed, basically taking care of um, their citizens' information. Uh, so this is a typical security measure that really doesn't hold up. But, and there are examples much, much worse than this. So simple things. Um, Last uh, weekend, we did a, a crypto party um, here uh, in Reykjavik, and a lot of people showed up, and it was a lot of fun. And we just, in a single afternoon, uh, taught a whole bunch of people how to digitally protect themselves a bit better than what they did before. I'm not saying, you know, we 
made them into super hackers in a single afternoon, but you can do a lot in a few hours just by teaching people some basic tricks and some basic concepts. So one of the simplest things that everybody can do for free, and that will uh, can do a lot, is to use, a f instead of one browser for everything, and mixing up all your data streams, um, split it out a bit. So I have a browser for social media stuff, where I have no expectation of privacy whatsoever, and I know for a fact that you know that stuff is all monitored and copied and uh, looked at by all kinds of other people. So I do Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn, all that crap I do in that browser. Then I have uh, the Tor browser, which is sort of the hardcore privacy stuff, not suitable for watching streaming video, but very, very private if you use it correctly. And I have something in between, which is Firefox, in which I have a whole bunch of plugins to uh, prevent media companies from tracking me. And there I access online file storage, my uh, wiki of my company, and, and news websites, and stuff like that. So this is just one of those very simple things. It requires you to grab a bit of software from the internet, which is free. And it requires a little bit of discipline. And it already, you're creating segments with your personal information that people then can't get into. Another thing you can do is try to avoid using software that actually isn't yours and that you don't control, even though you bought it. And actually, this is most of the software that most people use. Things like Mac OS, uh, OS X or Microsoft Windows. You paid for it, but it's not yours. You are merely buying the right to use it under a set of conditions determined by the vendor that can be changed by the vendor retroactively without telling you and so what those computers actually do under the hood while you're not watching, you don't know. Probably nothing, but you don't know. With systems that are open source, which means that everybody can look at how the software is made under the hood and how it's working, you can be sure that it doesn't do any funny stuff. Because lots of people are looking at it, and if it were doing any funny stuff, people would start screaming very loudly. So this is, in a sense, much more democratic, and that everybody can, you know, Pop the hood. Imagine buying a car and then you have to sign a letter that you promise not to look under the hood of the car, not to look at the engine. And if you do, you can get a ginormous fine or even in the US go to prison for it. Would you buy such a car? Most of us probably eh, rather not. Even if it was a very pretty car with an Apple logo on it, made from crushed <laughs> aluminium, you know. Still, eh, rather not. So this isn't always the prettiest software um, and it doesn't come in shiny brushed aluminium casing but it does take care of you very well. And of course it's free. So that's nice as well. So I mentioned the Tor browser. Email encryption is something that really everybody should have as a very, very basic mechanism. Again, all the tools for that are free. The problem there is that it's still a bit iffy to set up initially. It requires some tweaking. So this is what crypto parties are for because there's gonna be somebody there who actually knows this stuff and they can then help you you know, get over that initial hurdle of getting to know the system. Once it is set up, it gets very easy very quickly. And at least now you can email back and forth with people you care about without anybody being able to see inside the mails. This is not perfect security, but it's a really nice first step from having a Gmail account where you can read what's in your Gmail and the person you're sending it to, plus 16 US agencies, possibly the Chinese government and several private companies. It, always gives me a bit of an itch. So this is what main encryption does. Um, you have two keys, a public key that you spread around the internet and a private key that is on your computer and never ever leaves there. And you use a public key to encrypt the message to the person and they use their private key to decrypt that message. And because the private key is only on Alice's computer, once the message is decrypted and it's a one-way process, nobody can ever read it again if you use a proper long key. Is it possible to crack that code? Well, in theory, yes, but we now use keys that are so long that this would take, um, you know, a large nation state like the US, a significant chunk of all their computing power to maybe crack it. And if you're that important to them to crack your mail, then probably you have other problems as well. <laughs> um, you know, then you're probably called Julian Assange or something like that. So, <laughs> Uh, this is uh, how uh, Annie and me email back and forth, um, and we do it with every email, not just the important ones. Because if we were only encrypting the important emails, we would be telling all kinds of people that these are the important emails. 
So you don't want to do that. So what you want to do is to get yourself in a pattern where between all the other people that you have this setup with, you just encrypt everything by default, standard, automatically. So when we mail each other a shopping list, it's encrypted with a 4,000 bit key. And you know, if somebody wants to try to crack it and you know, spend 50 years worth of supercomputer time on that, hey, you know, much luck to you. The more people that use this, the safer everybody will get. Because now, of course, we are in a tiny minority that encrypts our email. So our emails stand out because they are encrypted. Because most people don't encrypt their emails. If everybody were to encrypt their email, of even more people, then our emails wouldn't stand out. So by me using this and by you using this, we make each other safer as well as ourselves. So there's solidarity in there that I think is worthwhile. Now, the other weird thing that has happened over the last decade is that um, America reserves the rights to do all kinds of weird things to uh, other countries uh, or computers in other countries, even if you think they're yours. So if you have a, a company or a non-profit or just your private person and you have a server and you're an Icelandic citizen and your server is on Icelandic territory, but your server running is under a uh, .com address, then according to American law, or their interpretation of their current laws, it's an American server and it's American territory, and therefore you fall under the Patriot Act, which essentially means you have no rights. You know, there's no judicial oversight or anything. So if .com, .org, .net, all those US-based domains, anything that runs under that, any company that uses this, any individual that uses this, falls under the Patriot Act, and therefore, again, you have no rights. You have no expectation of privacy. All kinds of weird things can be done to the system <coughs> without any form of judicial oversight. America can also demand that you are extradited to them if they think you, if they feel that you broke their laws, even if you didn't break any laws in your country where other things might be legal and illegal. This is a rather weird situation. So we try to uh, use uh, those kinds of domains. .ch is Switzerland, which is really very, very solid, you know, not a member of the EU, not a member of NATO, not a member of the uh, uh, United Nations even. They're just their own little country. Nobody has attacked them in several centuries and nobody would dare to. Um, so that's very solid. .nl, the Netherlands, where I'm originally from, Germany, uh, where I now live, and Iceland. Uh, I'm not sure what the costs are here. I think that they're a bit higher than some of the other domains. Um, and I hope the government sort of would protest if somebody from outside would try to do something funny to such a, uh, such a domain. But I think all of these are preferable over the US-based uh, ones. Although ha the domain itself is not a guarantee uh, for, um, for safety. <laughs> I just keep wondering, I've stopped using this crap uh, uh, well over a decade ago and I still enjoy not having to deal with this sort of stuff uh, all the time. Not that my computer never crashes, but this is this is a rare occurrence. Um, most people aren't even aware that there's a choice. So they talk about a market and a free market, but of course a free market presumes A, that you have a choice. Try buying a laptop uh, without it having already software on it that you pay for. And you must be aware that there is a choice. You must be aware that there is something else in existence. So I already told you, there's something called Linux. For instance, Ubuntu Linux, which is one of the flavors. You can download it for free, use it for free. It'll update every, um, every six months, if you like. Um, and it does most of the things that Windows and Mac OS does, including now, since about half a year, um, much more gaming than was there before. This was always the big thing that it wasn't good at. It's now getting better at that as well. So we are getting pretty close. So you need to um, protect yourself from uh, bad things on the net because generally your government isn't capable or even willing to do so. Um, so you need to do some things to that, such as encrypting your mail. Then certainly if you're an organization, you might want to think about if you can detect the fact that maybe at some point this castle wall was breached. So you don't want to have just a castle wall, you want to have something some method or a technical trick, but usually just a procedure where you can check that, hey, are there other people snooping around on our systems? Um, and this can be very technical, but it can also be purely procedural. You know, selectively leaking information and see where it goes to, for instance. And then, assuming you have a detection mechanism in place to detect the breach, you need a response plan. 
because you don't need to think about what you're going to do for a response when the event happens. You need to think about it beforehand. Now, this sort of stuff applies more to organizations than individuals. But even as an individual, you kind of think, okay, well, what if I find out that somebody's messing around in my laptop? You know, what are the first three things I'm going to do? Do I have a phone number of somebody I can, I can call to help me? As simple as that. A, a plan doesn't have to be a phone book thick thing. It can be, you know, a little paper with an email address or a phone number. You call with somebody who can help you out. So this is essentially the basic elements of information. Whether you're an individual or a Fortune 500 companies, it's all the same. Now, today's reality is uh, a little bit of this. Um, for both individuals and um, companies, that you can buy different hardware, laptops, PCs, servers, computers, stuff like that. That's a fairly well-functioning market. There is actual choice. You can you know, buy different brands, you can buy different stuff at different price performance points. So that is actually a market, the hardware stuff, that functions reasonably well. But then you get into trouble, because the platform, the operating system, middleware, the sort of software that does stuff for other software but that you don't see, like a database, for instance, applications, and the way you then look at the information, the interface, they're often all tied together into one sort of big blob that is all interdependent. So if you're used to one of the applications, then you're sort of forced to buy the operating system, or vice versa, there are all kinds of things. So now, to what extent are you even in charge as a small organization or an individual about well, how you use information systems? If, if there's a bunch of you know, commercial companies actually making choices for you and then saying, oh no, but if you want that, it only works with this, so you only need this to buy this other stuff. Now, this has been going on for quite a while, it's been a problem for quite a while, and it's been difficult to change things because of it. If you do nothing, then things will get worse for the simple fact that it's in the commercial interest of technology companies and software companies to sell you more crap. That's what they do. So I made this picture actually in early 2002 when I tried to explain some of these phenomena to uh, directors of large public sector institutions in the Netherlands. Um, and only last month, Microsoft was so good to oblige me finally in sort of going all the way that and now they indeed sell uh, platform windows that is tied to the hardware, so it's tied to the PC that you bought. You can move to another PC. You can also not, when you buy the PC, to choose to not to buy it. So that's a very nice combination. And then there's stuff like Microsoft Office, which is now also tied to the same hardware. So you buy a license, you buy the right to use it. You don't own it, you buy a right to use it. Important difference. But it's also tied to the hardware. If the hardware breaks, then you have to call them and you have to go through the whole procedure. So again, Whose computer is this anyway? Is it your computer or is it sort of their computer and you're just using it? It becomes a bit vague. And of course, there's applications, for instance, financial applications, that require Microsoft Office as a sort of a middleware layer. So you can only use your financial application if you have a certain version of Excel. So it's all tied together in one thing. And this is a rather um, scary ball of wax that you have to deal with if information is you know, everything you do every day, all day, it, it, and you can't live without it. And if you don't have access to it, then things start to go wrong very, very quickly. Um, imagine a city like Reykjavik shutting off the computer. See what happens within one hour, one day, one week. It wouldn't be pretty. So, I think what, whether you're an individual or a large institution, what you should aim for is to have a little bit of knowledge about these different bits of how you use computers or sets of computers and try to separate out all these layers and say, okay, look, we've got different hardware. We should be able to choose different hardware with different OSs and different middle layers. And the applications, that's the important bit, especially if you're an organization. There are certain stuff that you do with an application that's uni unique to your organization. So that's the stuff you should really keep close to. All those other generic things, like a platform like Linux, you can just download it and use it. Middleware, like a database or a web server or all that stuff that everybody needs, again, you can just download it for free. It's already all available. So all the green bits, they're various flavors for various solutions and they're all freely available. And they're free both in the cost sense as in the freedom sense because you can study how they work and then you can adapt them or have them adapted. You can check that they do what they're supposed to do and nothing else. And perhaps if you're a university, 
there's a bunch of core applications that you want to control yourself because this is what you are about. Um, I'm not saying that you know you're going to code everything from the ground up, but you want to keep that very close uh, to you because the application is actually very close to the core functionality of what your organization is about. So we have the rights to use these kinds of things. We still have those rights, although not on all computers. So if you use an iPad for computing purposes, your right set is very, very limited because actually it is Apple that determines what applications you can install on it. So again, it begs the question, whose computer is this anyway? Um, but as with any rights, use it or lose it. If we don't use these rights, if we don't do this, all of us together, then we're going to wake up someday and all our computers will be like iPads and Xboxes. And we will only be allowed to use them for purposes and in ways that a commercial entity has figured out to profit from. And not in other ways that might not be profitable for some. So use it or lose it, I think, is a very important principle. Um, and so if companies don't want to uh, work with you or do things for you, basically walk away. Sometimes it's a little bit scary. It takes a little bit of work, but you can just walk away and continue to live. And again, you know, you might need some help with that, and that's okay. There are people also here in Iceland that you can ask for help, and they will be happy to give it to you. So, I think that even if you're not an IT professional and just somebody who wants to use computers to get through the day, um, you want to get a bit more political about how you think about these machines that are defining this century. So I always like um, rehacking um, the U.S. Uh, Declaration of Independence because actually the U.S. nicked it from the Dutch Declaration of Independence, which is 180 years older. Um, but these are very, very basic uh, principles that we use technology because we want it to do stuff for us. It shouldn't be doing stuff for other people. So if it doesn't work for us, then we need to replace it with somebody or something else that does. If we find that Facebook and Google and iPads are no longer serving us but are serving commercial interests of parties outside us, then maybe we just get rid of them. And again, that might be scary and painful, um, the transition process, but if you come out at the other end, you are a much more freer person. And in the process, you've learned a lot of other stuff that yeah, it turns out that you can actually do this, that you're much more competent than maybe you thought before. Now, such a process is always painful and difficult. So this is how I explain this to senior managers. It's a story about Napoleon, and he was riding along in the south of France with the generals along the road, and the sun was shining, and they had all these wooden uniforms, and everybody was sweating like crazy. So Napoleon got a brainwave. He said, look, what we're going to do is this. We're going to plant trees along all the roads in France, then the, the trees will grow, they will provide shades so our soldiers can march in the shades to the battlefield, and then when they arrive at the battlefield, they'll be much fitter. And he thought this was a brilliant idea. But of course, all the generals didn't want to be into gardening because they were generals and they were not gardeners. So they started figuring out all kinds of reasons why this could not be done. Um, and they were very creative in that. So it went on and on and on and on. And then, the senior most general said, well, Mr. Bonaparte, you do understand that it takes 20 years for the trees to grow tall enough to provide the shade that you're talking about. So basically he was saying, look, this is going to take a long while, so let's not bother at all. And Napoleon completely reversed the situation and says, yes, of course I understand that it's going to take a long time. This is why I am ordering you to start planting tonight. So you can always say that, yes, it's a big problem, therefore let's not start to solve it. But on the other way, you can say, hey, this is a big problem. We'd better get to it right now, because no matter what we do, it's going to take us some while to, you know, to fix this. So I think in a world that's gone a little bit crazy over the last decade, <laughs> we need to be in all kinds of areas. And you know, this just happens to be my personal area of hobbyism and some of these. We need to be a little bit more principled. We need to be dare to be principled. And yes, this may seriously damage your career options. I've I know this from personal experience. So go hang out with your friendly neighborhood hacker. Um, hug your local geek, as my girlfriend always says. It's very important <laughs> to them, and possibly also as you. Um, these are the people who know this stuff. And of course, um, maybe you should train some more. Start, start young, 
and then by the time they're 14, they can help their parents and grandparents to get all these things uh, online. There is a hackerspace here. There are other places where these people hang out. You can go and meet them, have some fun with them. Um, and possibly you can help them with other things. You can do stuff for each other. So this is things you can do today. And um, I think that will really make your society a lot better and will allow you to use computing in a way that sort of befits a modern democracy. So I'm open to questions. I think we have a little bit of time. And I'm going to post these slides on various places on my Twitter stream and also on Facebook with a little bit of apprehension, but I'll do it anyway. Um, anybody who wants to use these slides for any educational purposes, they're completely free. It's just pictures I got off the interwebs anyway. Um, the only thing you can't do it is like holding these very sort of commercial social media experts and make lots of money without involving me. If you want to do that, then give me a call and we'll make a deal. Any other purpose, completely free. Enjoy them. Thank you for your attention. Any questions or remarks? Yes. Yeah, um, I was just wondering because um, you were know, talking about how to encrypt uh, email or, or protect yourself. What about cloud computing? Is there any way of protecting yourself uh, in the cloud? Where you have on, only if you use uh, the. So the question, I just want to make sure everybody heard. The question is, how can you use some of the security ideas in with cloud computing? The problem with cloud computing is you don't even know where the computer is, and you don't necessarily even know who owns it or how many parties it's been outsourced to. Um, so the only way you can retain privacy if you're using cloud computing uh, is if you use encryption on your side of the process. So. What I can do is I can take a file on my computer, encrypt it on my computer that I control, then stick it in my mega account in New Zealand, and then I only have the key to this file. And then what I can do is I can send a link to that file to somebody, and in a separate email, which I also encrypt, I can send them the decryption password. So cloud computing has its utility, but it does require an understanding of the user of what they're actually doing. And so my beef with many of these services is that they actually actively seem to work towards keeping the end users as dumb as possible. And, and that really, really bugs me because I think that it is very important that we all know something about the tools that we use in the same way that we know that if we want to drive our car at some point we're going to need to fill it up with petrol. We don't have to all be mechanics, but we all need to know just a tiny, tiny bit about you know, what does actually happen when I press the gas pedal. So I think that sort of minimal awareness of having a little bit of a concept, okay, if I send a file to Google, then it's no longer under my computer. So what does that mean? To, to just have that awareness, I think that's important. And so if you play by a couple of these very basic rules and spend a single Saturday afternoon informing yourself of a basic concept, you can have a very high level of privacy and still use many of these services. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the, the companies that are you know re that are making really really making money out of people on the internet, their business model, as you said, kind of depends on people being not being being in informed about how it works and being quite scared. Of it. How how can you how can you do you, do you know how, how how someone could build up a company that that would that would not that could make money without depending on the people not knowing anything about because we all need many yeah. living on Yeah, no, sure, sure. Well, this is, this is a problem. I, I, I might say, ultimately, this is a question, and don't, please don't take this the wrong way, ultimately, this is a question that interests me personally a lot less than the other questions of how can we make sure that individual human beings yeah, can yeah, be safe. Yeah, um, I, I do think there is probably a place for technologists to develop technologies uh, that actually improve the rights and the freedoms and the security of individual human beings. Of course, they run up into the problem, and I, again, I know this from personal experience, that there is a much greater market demand for screwing other people. This is why Facebook you know, is still worth several billion, maybe not as much as it used to be, but, um, and it's much harder to develop wonderful technology, make it available to the planet, and then find a way to make money out of that. But on the other hand, uh, you know, if you're okay with not being a multi-zillionaire, 
then often it's possible to provide services to people and, and do things that way. I am personally a great believer, and this is how I've always worked since I started working for myself, into just giving away as much as my knowledge as fast as possible, and then down the line stuff always comes back to you. That may not be the same Friday afternoon, but a week, a month, or a year later, people say, hey, you can help us out with something. And, and we understand that you need to make a living, so what, do you, what are you charging? And then you need to be reasonable. So I think in this model of creating and sharing technology, we're never going to be multi-gazillionaires. You know, if, if we all do stuff this way, there's not going to be new Bill Gates type people. But is that a bad thing? I don't think so. You mentioned that uh, the measures that you are arguing for might damage your career options. Do you, and you said uh, from personal experience. Yep. Can, can you can you elaborate on that? Oh, it's very very uh, very simple. I've um, uh, personally been called. But the last time I had a, a job with a company that I didn't own, um, I uh, protested against some of these kinds of policies for a government large government project that I was part of. And I said, I, you know, I think this is the wrong way to do modern computer education in a modern country. And basically, I was impinging on the commercial interest of a few very large, very powerful companies. And so then I was called into the office of the boss of my boss, and <coughs> it was made very clear to me that I could either stop doing this rather rapidly or go find other employment. Yeah. So again, this is also a good signal that you know that you're doing something important. <laughs> um, I, I, I really use it as a measure now that if you're not getting pushback, then you need to try harder. <laughs> and this is a very good metric to see if you're doing something relevant in society. You know, if you're not making anybody upset, then you need to just you know get up earlier and, and really try a bit harder. <laughs> because there's so much stuff that needs fixing that there's plenty to do. Yeah. It, it mentioned that the the government uh, agencies uh, or, or some other organizations were trying to, like we have here in Iceland, they want to stop uh, some kind of material on, on the internet. Yeah. Uh, and they should uh, focus more on educating people on, on what's dangerous and, and what should be avoided. Do you have a example of countries that do really spend money on, on such education for the general public? Uh, no, usually when this is done in places it's because you have a handful of people who just start doing it who don't wait for you know the national government complex discussion policy stuff they just in their local school they just start fixing the problem as they see it and quite often they can only do a little bit with a little bit of resources but you know you have to begin somewhere so all the examples i know up to right now where this is done, I know of, of examples of schools where children are actually taught what computing is, instead of being taught how to use a word processor from a very single vendor. So this is a big difference, to actually teach them about computing concepts and how, you know, what, what an information network is and how you can, how you can judge um, the accurateness of information when you have three different sources, those kinds of things. Actually teach people how to think instead of being consumers. But regrettably, so far, all of these um, have been fairly isolated cases. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that it can't be different. I mean, you know, I've been heard, I've been heard that in this country they actually jailed some bankers. Now, this is unique on the planet. I'm not saying you jailed enough of them and possibly you should have jailed longer or maybe other things should have been done to them. You know, think of something. But it was certainly a very good step in a very good direction. So maybe you can make other great steps in, in important directions as well. You don't have to be a big country to do big things. And in fact, it's quite possible that being a smaller country is actually quite advantageous. Be more nimble and informal a society. I, th I think it's certainly possible. And there are here in Iceland already great examples of people doing it. Not because they were asked to or ordered to, simply because they thought it was the right thing to do. So it's, it's already here, it's just not visible enough. Yes. Well, <coughs> uh, privacy and security issues are, are of course of concern uh, in their tour and uh, the communities around that play a great role. 
how about the infringement on like intellectual property and such and uh, distribution of, uh, of um, yeah, from intellectual property? Hmm. Well, the, the, term, the term intellectual property is problematic because it's quite unclear what it means. So there are different ways that we deal with ideas. We have patent law, which is a very specific set of laws. We have um, uh, brands, so you know you can only say that it's a Lenovo made by a certain brand if it's actually made, so I know that if I buy this. And there's copyright. Now, of those three, mostly we're talking about copyright. So let's talk about copyright. And the, the nebulous concept of, of intellectual property, which makes it sound like it's real things when it's actually just ideas. Um, I think it's a term we should really unlearn to use because it is confusing and therefore it confuses the debate. Now, having said that, originally copyright, and this was in 1705, had a period of 15 years. So if you create something, then you could own, for want of a better word, this idea or a, a piece of information like a book and then you know you could sell it through a publisher or through a printer over the last century we have increased the length of copyright certainly in Europe to the life of the author plus 75 years I have never understood how you can financially incentivize an author to create more things 75 years after they have died hmm. call me stupid but I don't see how that works um, the other fundamental problem with modern copyright law is, and I'm quoting here uh, one of the premier Dutch uh, law professors in this, who specialized in this area, is that the laws are so tied up in international treaties that are not made by parliaments or even read by them before they are hammered through. They're all created by groups of companies who make money of lengthening copyright until the end of forever minus one day. That. Um, this law professor a few years ago stated quite literally that it doesn't really matter what government we have in a certain country because the government has no control over the copyright. And I sort of sat at home that evening and thought about this for a little bit. And then I concluded, well, so basically a law professor who's expert in this area tells me, and the rest of the planet who wants to listen, that copyright laws are not made in a democratic fashion and they cannot be changed in a democratic way. And then my conclusion is that they simply no longer apply to me. Because I regard myself as a citizen of a democratic society. And so if there are laws in the books that are not made according to the democratic process, and I cannot change them by voting for certain people and demanding that they are changed, then those laws are something else. They are sort of a legal monster created by you know, the Disneys of this planet. And I personally do not feel morally obliged to follow these laws. Now, that does not mean that I don't think if you write a wonderful book, you should be able to make money of that. So I have a lot of writers that I'm a great fan of, and whenever they come up with a new book, I tend to buy or order the hardcover version, because that's where the writer makes his money. And if possible, I order it from the bookshop in the town where they live, because then I get a signed copy and the local bookshop makes some money on the side. I don't mind paying 50 euros for a book. And then what I do is actually I download the ebook from the Pirate Bay, which still is legal to do that in the Netherlands, so that's great. And then I read it on my phone, and the book just sits on the bookshelf and you know, improves the acoustics of our living room. <laughs> um, we had an interesting discussion yesterday evening, actually, with the Icelandic Interior Minister. And I'm not going to say much about what was said during that dinner, because this is what we agreed on. But we also um, talked about um, the idea that is floating around, and it's important to say that this is an idea at this, more, at this point, it's not a policy, of thinking about filtering parts of the internet that provides horrible, violent porn that can end up on the screens of young children. And one of the things I said, look, if you want to, A, there's two things that you want to do here. You want to make sure that young children don't see horrible things. I can understand that. And we'll have to think about, I don't think you can filter effectively the internet because it's never been worked. But you might want to see what you can do with education. But if you have a secondary goal, which is hurting the porn industry, which you believe are horrible people that make money of hurting other people, the best way to hurt the porn industry is basically support the pirate. <laughs> Stop the money flow. It's, it's really not that, you know, it's not rocket science. All these companies, they don't do this because they're evil, they do it to make money. Maybe they're also evil, but they do it because there's money to be made. 
if everybody grabs their porn fix off the pirate bay and there's no money to be made, the porn industry will go away. Maybe there's a few. I mean, the other thing that I wondered about is, okay, you're talking about 11-year-olds and you're worried that they might buy horrible porn online with credit cards. Do 11-year-olds have credit cards? And if so, why? I, again, I don't have children, so I don't know how that works these days. Um, I think as long as copyright laws are not made democratically, I'm not morally obliged to follow them. That's, that's my very simple thing. And I think that because of the technological pressures that we are now seeing, you know, sites like the Pirate Bay um, are not going to be shut down anymore. They have been built now to a level where they are so resistant to any form of national interference that they cannot be taken down anymore. So the cat's out of the bag. And even if the entire internet, you know, was largely taken down, then we would just take 10 euro USB drives and just share them amongst each other and do it that way. I mean, they are now big enough and cheap enough that you can just give them away to people. Here, here is a lifetime supply of e-books. Just keep the stick, whatever, you know, six euros, doesn't matter. Um, I was less concerned with the business of the world or the NPAs of the world than the big corporations, Sony and such. I was more concerned about the uh, small artists, you know, the private artists yep. who don't have their own sales channel or the sales yep. department or, or market, marketing division that are robbed of whatever you know, leaves out. Yep. And well, they're, they're be, 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 because of the internet today, more artists, as an individual artist, are making more money producing more art and culture than ever before in human history. That doesn't mean that everybody who calls themselves an artist and puts something out there has an automatic right to a level of income that can sustain them fully. In fact, historically, the vast majority of people who make cultural objects cannot live off the proceeds of this labor, and they do it alongside. And actually, maybe that's not so bad. Maybe people should make art and culture not just with the primary motive of living on it, but with the primary motive of making art and culture. So it's always been true that there are much more people who want to make stuff than there is a market for buying the stuff so that they can live off it. But I do think that one of the things the internet is doing is it is flattening out um, sort of how the money is distributed. So there will be few, fewer millionaires and gazillionaires and many more people who can make at least some money off whatever it is they are making. You can now self-publish a book for next to nothing globally and then you can charge whatever you feel is reasonable for it. And if you charge less, you will probably be selling more, although none of it is guaranteed. Um, but there's no indication anywhere, if you look at the numbers, that less art is being created or that art of lesser quality is being created because of the technological developments of the last decade. It's just that many people have an, have an you know, quite unrealistic expectation that if they just call themselves an artist, and therefore they will be automatically able to live off whatever it is, the art they make. And historically, this has never been true. You know, most painters can live off their work. It's only a few. Taking an example from the porn industry. The porn industry, uh, 10 years ago, was a very lucrative business. There was lots of money being made yeah. creating porn. That revenue stream is basically now gone because people don't want to get from the pirate bay, they go to the free website, where people pirate porn and stream them to people. So the porn industry is changing. I mean, you know, big production companies, whatever their names are, are basically they're not there anymore. They're empty shelves. And most of the profit in porn is having like advertisements for people, you know, you upload your videos to a website and you get paid your videos or whatever you want to those videos. Yeah. So it's quite, if that trend continues, then actually the whole industry will evaporate into, you know, very tiny groups of individuals who may make a little bit of money out of ad revenues, but there's not much going on there. And then, you know, all the videos will be just people's home videos that have leaked out because they didn't put proper encryption on their hard disk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, again, I don't think that would be a bad thing. And, and, and so uh, I think anybody who uh, feels that, for instance, the porn industry um, or many of these other sort of informational industries are evil people, and often I might actually agree with that. And then by far the simplest answer is not to, you know, go on a rampage and try to... Uh, you know, arrest a bunch of people who are hiding out somewhere in the woods of the Ukraine, because that's going to be pretty tough. Cut off the money supply and they'll just do something else. And I think it's very simple. Yeah. Can I just pick up a um, couple of points about the copyright and small artists? Um, Ian mentioned um, the fact that you can write a book and put it up on Amazon and sell it on Kindle for, say, 99 cents. 
There have been cases now where people have done just that, and they've developed this huge following. So they might have, there have been people who've done self-publishing books on Kindles and sold over a million copies. And of course, they get 70% of the cover price. So that's not a bad amount of money if you're selling a million copies per book that you write. Um, and there's another thing, I'm not sure, I'm in a room of geeks probably. One of the things I heard before the Kim.com mega upload website was taken down illegally by an FBI raid, SWAT team raid in New Zealand, was that he had announced a new business model where he would allow artists to upload their material, new artists, small artists, and they could keep 90% of anything, any revenue that was generated, he would keep 10%. I'm not sure if that's the case, but if it is, it's a radical, revolutionary new business model which would blow apart the copyright industry. And that might be an interesting theory about why the FBI went in with a SWAT team and illegally took down his site and arrested him and all the rest of it. I don't know. It's, it's, it's rather funny that somebody who runs a bunch of websites from New Zealand is arrested by methods and with weapons that sort of are more compatible to arresting Osama bin Laden. I mean, helicopters and machine guns and, and stuff like that. The, the re reaction was quite vicious. Mm. And, and that cannot be explained merely by somebody being a successful entrepreneur operating on the edge of legality, because actually that's what most software companies do. You know, and they make much more money than Kim.com ever. So, yeah, I, I think actually for the true artists who are first and foremost in it for the arts and then would like to make some money so they can continue to write great books or whatever they make, I think the internet on the whole is a blessing, although there may be individual cases. But with any change in society, with any technological change, there are always individual cases who, who lose you know, the previous model. But I think on the whole we, we stand to gain from, this, uh, from these developments. All right. I don't know how right. we're doing for time. Um, well, I personally have to go, but uh, you know that doesn't I think we have to be somewhere else. We some probably have to well. be somewhere. Else. We do. If there are no more questions, I just want to thank you again for showing up at a very late planned meeting at a very odd time. Um, if you think of any other great questions that uh, might inspire the both of us, send me an email or find me through some other channel. Type my name into Facebook, and you will find me. My coordinates are there. I. Uh, blog in both in Dutch and in English, so the English might be of use to you. Um, you can follow that, and there is even a Twitter feed that I sometimes say something on. Thank you all for your attention.